first Wednesday night service over at uh, the Prairie Drive Church when they had just moved in, I think the week after. And uh, I was not a believer, but I remember believing <laughs> that I was mighty scared. And I thought I saw smoke and vapor, and I know my knees were knocking. And I never went back. Well, didn't not never. I did go back, but um, it was 10 years later. But that was about 1984 or 85, I think. So the Lord is good, and uh, he preserves. He watches out for drunks and fools. I was one of each. And Father, I just want to give you thanks and praise tonight that you do preserve men, Lord God. Um, that you watch out, Lord, uh, for fools, for drunks, for sinners, Lord God. That you leave the 99 and you seek the one. And that angels in heaven rejoice, Lord God, when a sinner is brought to repentance and salvation. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you. For, in you there is grace and mercy. Lord, I ask you to send your spirit tonight that you would reveal these things, Lord, uh, in your word for us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Um, uh, kind of funny how the, the Spirit works. Um, you know, God will put something on your heart, then, you know, a Wednesday and a Sunday, and then, you know, the Lord will speak to it, either by a preacher or you hear somebody on the radio, or, you know, you just get a confirmation on stuff that you've... If you're seeking the Lord, you'll get a confirmation on things. And um, it was just kind of interesting. Bill has been preaching in the Old Testament and about uh, the um, doctrine of Balaam and what that was. So not that I'm going to preach on the doctrine of Balaam, but um, the likeness of it. And uh, it'll be in here a little bit in, in Malachi and, and in Peter. And if you would, uh, let's go to uh, Malachi chapter 2. I want to talk a little bit about um, what it is to be a, a saint. Um, Malachi is an interesting thing, or an interesting... Uh, he he kind of goes back to where Bill... Uh, was preaching out of Numbers, and uh, he, he talks to the people of God, to the priests, and says, these are the things that I require of you. And one of the things I wanted to kind of show tonight is that God requires no more or no less from us than what he required of Israel in their time. And I remember... Um, how he set out the camp um, in Numbers, and Balaam was asked to curse the people, and they couldn't. And it was just interesting to me that the camp was set out in the form of a cross. Um, Jesus was cursed for us. Uh, he who knew no sin became sin, um, that we might become his righteousness, that we might receive his righteousness. People who are going to come into the kingdom of God are going to be righteous. And those who are righteous are going to know that that righteousness is not theirs. It was a purchase. It was purchased for them by Jesus Christ. Um, so in uh, Malachi chapter 2, uh, let's start at verse 1. It says, Now, O priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you do not take it to heart. I'd like to stop there for a second. Um, one of the things that young people, that new Christians, that really anybody, I, I is having the ability to take to heart, literally, um, in a relationship form, what God says. Um, and oftentimes, I'll try in my own strength, 
um, which in my own strength usually ends up being anger, depending on what I'm dealing with. And <laughs> God says clearly, uh, he hates the man who trusts in the flesh. So taking it to heart um, really is considering ourselves helpless before God and coming to him for his mercy. It says in verse 3, Behold, I will rebuke your descendants, and I will spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your solemn feasts, and one will take you away with it, and you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you. That my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth. And justice was not found, was not found, injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and he turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of the priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts, but you have departed from the way. You have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble in the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, I also have made you contemptible and base before all people because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law. Have we all not one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another? By profaning the covenant of the fathers. Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. He has married a daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, being awake and aware, yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. Um, that was Israel's unfaithfulness. And the church also has an unfaithfulness. And we're going to look at that too. And God showed them very clearly that there was a covenant of peace, of grace, of mercy, of love. And that covenant, um, the fruits of it might be reaped in reverence before his name. Just reverence. A fear of the Lord is a good thing. Being able to say, like, as real as my relationship is with my wife or a friend, how real is God's relationship with you? And where are you with him? How do you interact with him? Where are your thoughts? You know, um, one of the difficult things, uh, I, I deal with a lot of difficult thoughts, but is to remember at every moment of the day, Lord, you know the thoughts of my mind, the intents of my heart, you know my soul. I keep nothing from you. I hide nothing from you. I am fallen and sinful. Lord, help me. And, you know, that is so opposite from what we hear in the world. And I, I want to I try to remember that a priest is someone it, who comes to God by no merit of his own. In fact, understanding that he is without merit and wants to be able to minister the things of God um, as a vessel. And if we, if we come in our own strength, 
And if we come in our own reasoning, we can find plenty of scriptures that tell us there is a way that seems right unto man, the end therein is death. I do not inherently know God's ways. And if God is calling the church and people within the church to be priests, um, hermeneutics aren't going to do you a whole lot of good. They will help you understand uh, in a rational manner the word, but they will not prepare you for the priesthood. Only reverence will, and only coming to God. Needy, desperate, blind, naked, wretched, and understanding those things will he begin to start working with us and filling us. Um, if you would, turn to uh, 1 Peter. Let's go to chapter 2 in 1 Peter. First Peter chapter 2. Starting at verse 9. Um, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners, as pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Um, what will happen to a church that follows false prophets? Um, how does the church be true um, in, in the union of salvation, and I say that in union of salvation as um, as a marriage, we are the the bride of Christ. Um, we will come to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and it is like it says uh, in Revelations, remembering our first love, remembering our first love. Um, Go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. Starting in verse 17. This is, uh, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first... What will the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Um, the Bible lays out in the scriptures the time of Jacob's trouble for Israel. Um, in Numbers and in Malachi, um, God uh, reproves them for being unfaithful in, in marriage to him as the bride of God, as the bride of Christ. In the church, he calls the church to beware of um, false prophets. And more and more leaders of megachurches are denouncing the, the, the 
foundational stones of the church. They are saying that these things are not politically correct without saying that they're not politically correct. They're saying that they're not acceptable to man's idea of mercy. Therefore, God must not be good. Um, as the church uh, would follow after um, false prophets, uh, you know, uh, in Thessalonians, it's warned of uh, many antichrists have come, those instead of Christ. And that, that um, spirit of antichrist is found uh, in that denial of those foundational tenets of the scriptures that many megachurches are denying. Um, in, uh, in Malachi chapter 4, let's go back to Malachi. Malachi chapter 4. Verse 1. See, judgment's coming. Um, Bill talked a lot about it in his series on uh, Balaam, the doctrine of Balaam. Judgment's coming for Israel, and that judgment will bring them back into fellowship with God at a very high cost. Um, I mean... They're going to be run ragged. They're going to be decimated in their populations. But they'll see him. They'll find Christ. They'll believe in Jesus. And for the church too. Judgment's starting here. And then it's going to Israel. Judgment will start in the house of the Lord. Uh, Malachi verse 4. For behold the day coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. Um, jump over to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. I'm not sure, you know, I just was praying and I asked the Lord uh, for some understanding of, you know, what it is. Uh, you know, why is it so important now? And uh, Revelation 3 is kind of terrifying. There's some parts in there for the Christian that ought to be a wake-up call. It says uh, in verse 3, uh, before we go into verse 3, Sardis, the church of Sardis, interesting history, about 17 AD, it was wiped out by an earthquake, and uh, Roman emperor, I uh, can't remember his name, rebuilt it. Well, they got into so much debt, they, became, they actually literally had to worship Caesar. Um, and the church of Sardis made some accommodation for that somehow. So they, 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 were, uh, they were reproved by the Lord. That's why he wrote a letter to them in chapter 3. And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, uh, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you're dead. Be watchful. Strengthen the things that remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. The church is called to repent. I think in Christianity in America, that that is a foreign concept a church called to repent. Why would a church be called to repent? Because like Sardis, they made some accommodation for the world that was around them. Somehow, uh, Sardis 
made an accommodation to to allow maybe the you know hey I got to give this coin to Caesar or, you know I forgot what the Jamie probably knows what the 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 when you had to drop the coin in the basket and give give uh, allegiance to Caesar there's a, a word for it or a f small phrase for it basically you had to name Caesar God and and somehow yeah uh, yeah and somehow they had to uh, worship in that. And God's very serious about uh, who he is. Verse 2, it says, Be watchful, strengthen the things that w which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch... I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who do not defile their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. For he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will blot out his name, I will not Blot out his name from the book of life. To be entered into the book of life and have your name blotted out. What a horrifying, horrifying prospect for anyone to, to be baptized, to um, testify to God, to try to walk a Christian life, to be pulled in. The Bible says we have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And in popular society, there are um, lots of horrible, demonic, depicting movies, horror films. Um, in my travels as a sinner, here's what I can tell um, about that portion of the devil, is that if you knew what you were messing with in those movies, if you knew what was behind it, you would be absolutely horrified. And if you've seen hell at work in the streets of a city, you would think twice about putting your eyes on those things. Um, brokenness, death, halt, lame, <laughs> why Jesus healed that way? Because he was rescuing people from the demonic. And um, the world and the flesh are our other enemies. And the world and the flesh have a union. And Paul talks about it in Romans and says... In salvation, one dies in that union, the old union, and then is free to marry another. Christ is that other. He calls us to the marriage supper of the Lamb to be married uh, in this life to Him and to be faithful as you're faithful to a wife or a true friend. You don't just give them up um, when the world comes and taunts you and says, hey, you know, throw this person under the bus. No, they're my friend. There's honor there. And as I travel around, I see a world filled with dishonor, with unfaithfulness, and unbelief. And it is so easy for any Christian to be pulled into that because it is deceptive. Because it doesn't look like any of those things. It doesn't look like deceiving. It doesn't look like being unfaithful. 
it appeals to a certain aspect of our flesh that unless we are ruthless at the cross, look up and say, you know, Jesus, I don't have any, it feels good, and therefore I don't have any defense for it. Please show me, Lord. Please give me wisdom. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garment, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That people come in to a church and believe and are among the congregation, and he is speaking to the churches like this, terrifies me. Terrifies me. And, you know, not that any man has truly seen hell, but when you're a sinner, God shows you you're on the precipice of hell, ready to plunge yourself in. And I'd even tell you this, that I believe unregenerate men would rather be in hell than face the judgment of God in his presence. They will ask, please, speedily, let me go there because being in his presence in judgment will be more horrifying than the torments of hell. Back to Malachi chapter 4. Um, there is hope, there is a promise, and there is joy um, in faithfulness and in reverence, in a clean fear of the Lord, which is reverence. It's not found in any psychology or any filth. Um, it's a sleep and a rest for the soul that cannot be medicated into a, a person. It is, it is a blessing that's given to us from God for a good conscience because he keeps us clean. In verse uh, chapter 4, verse 2, it says, But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like a stall-fed calf. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. It was said of John the Baptist that he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. You know, I forget this a lot. You know, Elijah came and Moses came to, to meet the Lord. Elijah came, not just in the spirit and power of John the Baptist, but he came and Peter Wanted to build tabernacles for him, so they, you know, is like, like Peter. No. Listen to my son. You know, so much has been done over the centuries. Uh, been reading some things about uh, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards. People once feared God. And when they feared God, the Spirit of God would show up and affect them experientially. And it wasn't in barking like dogs or roaring like lions or shaking, convulsing. People would pass out for the fear of a holy God and His judgment. Where is the fear of the Lord? Where is the fear of being blotted out of the book of life 
in the church? Where are those things that God put in us um, to draw us to reverence for him? Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. I'd like to talk about those two things, the hearts of the fathers. Um, in the weakness of flesh, I often get angry with my kids when they're not doing right. Um, one of the things I ask for from the Lord is to abandon um, those things that are fleshly, that don't work His righteousness. And um, it's a huge struggle. My kids oftentimes point out that weakness of uh, being angry. Uh, I seem to be angry all the time, I'm told. <laughs> and I am. I'm angry with sin, and I let it come out in the flesh. I, I agree. I am angry with sin. I'm angry with myself when I'm sinful. But the reason is because of God's promises to me for my children. I didn't have kids to, none of, no Christian has kids to watch them go to hell. No, no Christian father or mother has kids to watch them be drawn away by the world. We fight for you. We fight for our kids. They think we're just being rough on them. But we're fighting for them because we know a real heaven and we know a real hell. And part of the reason I get so angry at the sin of my kids is because one of the promises that God made to me a long time ago, I was funny, funny little story. Um, my wife wanted to name our son Levi, Levi. You already know who won this battle. But um, I wanted a different name. I wanted um, an Irish name. I wanted, um, what, what name did I want? Liam. I wanted Liam. And I thought that was it, and I was mad. I was like, Levi, he was a bad guy. I was mistaken. I'm mean, a young Christian. I mistake him for Eli. And uh, I was, uh, Wendy had been working second shift at the hospital. No? You're already done with that. I just remember being mad at her, and I was out in the garden, and I was, Kind of, you know, one of those fuming, hoeing a row, hoeing a row. And like, just kind of, you know, God, why, why, why does my wife not listen to me? What am I doing wrong? And, you know, and all of a sudden, it's like somebody boomed in my head. Read Malachi chapter 2. And I had never, I hadn't even gotten into the, small, the lesser prophets at that time. So I get, go in and I'm like, start reading, you know, uh, in chapter 2. And I just, I, I just remember the condition of my heart. And uh, when it says that you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant is with Levi, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace. And I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me. And that's always been my hope. And it is hard sometimes to remember and believe the promises of God that He has made throughout our lives and to walk in them today. That's the hard part. It was awesome when He made the promise, but when you're over here and it doesn't look like that promise is ever going to come around, my first temptation to deal with that unfaithfulness whether myself or in my children, 
is to get angry and try to, you know, take, or if I can get that top off, I know I can get it in there, you know, and it just, just makes it worse. And I guess we are going to be as a church judged like Israel. And we have to find, um, as a body, as individuals, repentance continually. Because we still wear a raiment of flesh that is fallen, that is naturally encoursing through its DNA sinful at every turn. And Lord, help us to recognize that, to come to the altar, to bow down, to cry out for mercy and grace. And I just think that sometimes in that spirit, that the spirit of God will come and show us many things and make us able to withstand the world, and the flesh, and the devil. And without that, um, I almost think that we get a little bit of um, hyper-Calvinism. You know, we get saved, and we just, hey, we're, we're saved. Yeah, you know, I believe, yeah. All these, and we forget that God calls the church to repentance. And God says, even you, O church, blot out your name from the book of life to the church. Why? Because they made accommodations for the world, for the flesh, for the devil. But God is the God of redemption. And I will ever be thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ and I ask God tonight, I'm just going to close right here. I ask him tonight um, in prayer, Lord, I lift this up to you. And I ask, Lord, that you would send your spirit. That I would not um, diminish the blood of Jesus Christ by the actions of your servant, Lord. But that I would understand, Lord, my frailty in sin that I would come to you in boldness because of that blood, that blood of Jesus Christ, that I exhort you, Lord, I, I beg of you and I plead of you, send your Holy Spirit now, Lord God, to fill us with your Spirit, that we might glorify your name in the works that we work of good to our children, to our church, to our community, Lord God, to the people and appointments that you put before us, Lord. That you would be glorified in it, Lord, and not us. Father, I thank you that that judgment that is coming, that even is on our doorstep, Lord, might cause us to repent, to turn, to seek you, to desire that first love of Jesus that we knew so long ago we might know it today too in the freshness and newness that the Spirit provides. Father, I thank you for this body of believers in grace. Lord, I'm here because of people who prayed me into the kingdom of heaven and because you had mercy and saved me, Lord. You have saved every person who is here, Lord. Father, I thank you for that. And I ask that you would fill these seats Sundays and Wednesdays people who fear the Lord and who have found you worthy to be praised at your altar in your house, Lord. We give you thanks and praise tonight in Jesus' name.